up this morning. Why don't you turn around and find a few people and give them a good Christian welcome this morning. Amen. Welcome to church, friends. We're so happy to have you here. The Bible tells us in Matthew 18, verse 20, it says that uh, Jesus tells us wherever two or three are gathered, that he is here. Amen. How many are happy that Jesus is here? Praise the Lord. And if Jesus is here, you're here. Hallelujah. We're a big family. So uh, welcome to church this morning. We're happy to have you here. And uh, there's a little bit of music going on in the background. Praise the Lord. Hey, we got some backup vocals. That's good. Uh, God is good, friends. We're welcoming you. If you're here listening to us online, watching us online, we welcome you. If you're new here today uh, and you uh, just want to make yourself known so that we can uh, get to know you, there's connect cards in the pews. You'll see some cards there. Fill them out. You might have a prayer or you might, uh, you might have a question about Bible studies or, or how to get involved in the church. You can fill one of those out and, and uh, put that in the offering plate at the end of service. We, we'd be so uh, honored to get to know you and, and uh, walk with you in your faith. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. We're going to keep singing about the Lord this morning. His goodness. Praise the name of Jesus.
we bless the name of Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, He's worthy Lord. to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a song called Your Name, just the chorus. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nations sing louder. There's nothing as the power to say your name. Your a house of worship. This is a place of praise where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. What a great song, Lord, as we recognize, as we've come together today. This is the house of worship. And Lord, we would just want to worship you, and we would just want to open our hearts and lives to you and allow you to come by your spirit, because this can be a place of miracles. As we've sung this morning, we're believing for great things in this place today. I pray that as we reach out to you, precious Holy Spirit, you know us, you know exactly where we're coming from, you know the struggles we're going through, and you know how to meet us in a, in a, in a supernatural way. And so our faith arises, Lord, we respond to you today. We minister to our hearts and lives today. For those that need a touch from the Lord, may they experience you in a special way. And we, and we take some time to remember some individuals in prayer, in prayer this morning. We think of Elizabeth Bell, who's, who's in the hospital. Lord just called me the other day and told me she was in the hospital. And we pray for her that you would touch her and you would heal her body in Jesus' precious name. And we think of Marla, Lord. And, uh, Marla was at home today, went for surgery on her wrist just on this past Friday. We just pray that, Lord, that you would restore that wrist. And that, Lord Jesus, we thank you for her life and her ministry. Be with her through this time. We commit her to your care. We think of Anne's daughter, Lord Jen, who's had some, some tough days, Lord. And um, just walking through this time of chemotherapy, Lord, just minister to her. Wrap your arms around her. Let her know you love her. And you're with her, and you're able to bring her through, through, the, through this difficult time. We just commit that family today. And we think of Judy, who is at home also, just went for, through surgery just restore her health, we pray, in Jesus' name. And we've been praying for Ayla's brother, Lord, just for a miracle in his body, and for Marlene's sister, Lord, and her friend Judy, and Dave Johnson, all these people that are in need of a touch from the Lord, we pray that you administer to them and touch them and heal them. And for us that are here today and those that have tuned in online, may we just experience you, draw nearer to you, love you more, and grow deeper in our faith today. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name, and all of God's people said, amen. and good amen, and you may be seated, and good morning, Elam. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to, uh, just good to be back. Of course, Thelma and I were away uh, last week, last Sunday, I guess last Sunday we were in Cosimo, we went there for a week, and we watched the service last Sunday morning uh, from Cosimo, Sunday afternoon. And, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't tell you that it was 29 degrees all week. <laughs> did, did I hear a rumor here that it snowed a little bit? It was cold? Yeah. Did I hear that? What, a ch- what are the chances of that happening? We're away. God is good. <laughs> and, and I've lost a few friends this morning. Sorry about that. Well, carry on. Good to see you. Good to have you here in the house of the Lord. Good to worship. Good to, like, that's an amazing song. I'm not sure if I've, we've ever sung that song in this church, but wow, what an amazing song to sing and to learn, especially this Sunday as we talk about God and uh, his ability to do supernatural things in our life. So here's some uh, announcements. Tonight we have a community prayer meeting here at Elam. Every once a month, we, a number of churches get together and we just take an hour to pray for our community. And I would encourage you tonight, if you can come from five to six, join other people from various congregations or churches just to call on the Lord. How many know there's power in prayer? Amen? And God does amazing things as we come together, not only as a church, but as a, as a community of believers and call on the Lord because we can't do anything in ourselves. We need the Lord. And so I encourage you to come out tonight. Um, just want to mention that uh, if you haven't picked up your income tax form, make sure uh, you, get, you pick it up. It's in your mailbox on the way back. You can get that for if you're planning on doing your income tax in the next few weeks. You'll need that. 
Also, I just want to mention our offering. Thank you again for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord. You're just, you're just so faithful, and many of you give so sacrificially. For those of you that want to give this morning, there is an offering plate you'd find in the back. Uh, make sure you put your, if you want record for income tax purposes, make sure you put your money in the envelope, put your name and some information, your address on that envelope, place it in the offering plate. And of course, we do have e-transfer. If you want more information on that, that is in the bulletin, and you can call the office for more information. So let's just take a moment and, uh, and just pray and thank the Lord for this privilege of partnering with him. So thank you, Jesus again, for uh, the, the privilege of working with you. And uh, you're God, you're in control, but you have chosen to work through people that are willing to give of their time and their talents, their money, to invest in your kingdom. And so we're so thankful for that, Lord Jesus. We're so thankful that, Lord, that we can be a part of that. I pray you bless, gift, and giver in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday was the coldest night of the year. Did you want to say anything about that, Pastor Clinton? Here we go. There we go. He's all set. I always bring a hat. Oh, sure. Um, thank you for everyone who donated to uh, our fundraising efforts. Uh, in total, I believe they raised over $130,000 towards uh, the King Vision Place. And our young adult group, our, our E-Gen, uh, we, we went out there, we walked... Uh, five kilometers, and uh, we enjoyed our time, and we raised over $1,300. Amen. So, uh, praise the Lord. God is Amen. good, and Amen. Uh, what an exciting opportunity to, to get together. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand with me again, and we're going to sing one more song. As we do that, we're going to dismiss the children this morning. Of course, we have nursery for babies. We have, uh, we have toddler church for children ages 2 to 4, and we have super church for children ages 5 to 10, and so parents... As we sing this song, you can bring your children downstairs as we prepare for the service here.
And so this morning, Lord, as we, we look into your word and uh, we look at this topic of healing this morning, we would pray in Jesus' name, even right now, before the word is even presented, that you would do something special in our lives, that you begin to perform some miracles in people's lives, physically and mentally and emotionally. I pray that you be moving by your spirit throughout this service. We submit to your will. We submit to your word. I pray that we have ears to hear and a heart to respond. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And of course, there will be a ver there's different scripture verses we have in the bulletin, uh, in the back of your bulletin. And if you have your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew. And uh, we will be looking at a number of scriptures as we talk about healing this morning. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 53 says. A familiar passage of scripture, if you've been in the church for a while, it says, but he was, and that's Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, today we're going to talk about healing. And I have a little confession to make as we begin. I must confess to you, there are a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to this topic. And I am very aware of that. Questions like, uh, why does God tell us to pray for miracles while well, he doesn't always provide the miracle that we pray? That's a, that's a good question. Why does God call himself the God who, who heals us if he doesn't always heal us? Why, why is that part of his name, his character? And why does God seem to heal some people who never ask for it and then not heal people who, who ask for it continuously? If you were here on, um, on uh, Friday night, you, you came and saw the, the movie called, it was called, it was called I Still Believe, a true story of Jeremy McCamp. We watched that Friday night, and it's a story of his the relationship he had with this girl, eventually married the girl, discovered she had cancer, prayed for her, and she died. And so, obviously, that happens. That happens, and it raises a lot of questions in our mind. Talking about movies, we are going to plan for another one in a few weeks. About a month, we're going to show The Passion just before Easter. And so, just be aware of that. We will be promoting that in the next few weeks. So, it's been the question mark of suffering which turns like a hook and stabs into the heart of every human being. We've all felt the stab, the wound that comes. Well, today I'm going to do my best to address the questions in re that revolve around this area called healing. And we're going to ask some difficult questions, face some difficult scenarios, and do our best to provide some biblical answers for you this morning. You know, folks, I was thinking as we look at the subject, you can't, you, you can't properly, properly understand the nature of healing until you fully understand the root of suffering, the root of suffering. So let's begin at the very core of this matter today. What is the root cause of suffering? Surprising as it is to many people, the Bible is very clear when it comes to the root cause of suffering. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5. He said, sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death entered through sin, and in this way death came to all men and women because all have sinned. So this is not a mystery. Suffering, death, all have come into our world because of sin. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, he says, the wages of sin is death. It's death. And so what's the root cause of suffering? Well, if you hold to a biblical worldview, the answer is simple. It is straightforward. Sin is at the root of, of suffering. It's at the root of it. So what exactly is sin then? What is sin? The word literally means to miss the mark. It means to fall short. It means to fail. 
Now, sin is something that we do, certainly, but the term means something more than, than what we do. It, it's something that we do, but in doing it, it unleashes consequences, ongoing, lingering consequences. Think of it this word, the, think of it this way. The word sin is like the word jump. It's something that you do, but depending on the height that you do it from, it unleashes consequences. If, you, for example, if you're up on the balcony, if you jump from the balcony, it's going to, for most of us, it's going to unleash some consequences, right? I mean, it, it, you break your leg or something, break your neck. So there's consequences. Jump is something that you do, but then once you've done it, it unleashes a whole bunch of hurt and pain and suffering. Well, in the same way, the ongoing consequences of sin, according to the Bible, is death. Now, death, what kind of death? Well, spiritual death, mental death, emotional death, physical death, eternal death. All of them are coming as their consequences, consequence of sin. And so, this, and so this, this sin, once we have done it, we have unleashed something in our lives that brings consequences that we see every day, where we have people with twisted desires and and weakened and broken bodies, and ultimately you have a corrupted creation as a result of sin. And so if you want to know who or what is responsible for all the suffering and the death in the world, it's the sinfulness of humanity that's corrupted mankind. Now this is not what God's, that's not, that's not God's design. What we experience right now was not God's, again, ultimate design, this is God's creation after it jumped. After, you know, after the fall, this is God's damaged creation. And so that's the answer to the first question. You know, where's this all this pain coming from? It's a result of sin. Which leads us to the next question. How has God responded to this reality? Because God has responded to this. How has God responded to this reality? Well, very simply, God, Jesus once and for all defeated sin. And so how is God responding to sin, to the root cause of suffering? Jesus dealt decisively with sin. Well, how did Jesus deal with sin? As we think about him and we think about the cross, he did it by taking everything that sin could throw at him. He took everything that sin could throw at him and he survived it. And by surviving it, he actually defeated sin. Let me explain it another way. He said, you see, when Jesus hung on the cross, all of the sin of mankind was poured out upon Jesus. He bore the weight, the full weight of every sin ever committed, ever will be committed, the full weight of humanity, the weight of sin, like a sponge, he absorbed the stain of all humanity's sin. And the wages that sin pays is death, of course. So he died because of the weight of sin, but because he himself was sinless, he rose from the dead because sin could not, hold, could not have a hold on him because he, he had no sin. He rose from the dead and now he offers to share his victory over sin and death with you and with me. He survived it, and by surviving it, he defeated it and, and offers, us, offers to share, us, share with us the victory of triumph over sin. The prophet Isaiah described it this way. We read it before. We read it in the beginning. Listen to it again. It says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid, there it is, has laid upon him the iniquity, the sin of us all. That's what the Bible says. Now what we just read was not only an ancient prophecy. It was actually written 700 years before Jesus died on the cross. But, it, but it also, it's also ancient poetry. Did you know that? Now, instead of rhyming words, ancient Hebrew poets often rhymed ideas, if you can kind of think in those terms. They rhymed ideas by taking the same thought and repeating it using different words. And, and Isaiah chapter 53 is a classic example of this. 
He was pierced for our transgressions is another way of saying he was crushed for our iniquities or he was bruised for our iniquities, which is another way of saying the chastisement of our peace was upon him, which is another way of saying by his stripes we are healed. And some same thought using different words that is really Hebrew poetry without necessarily rhyming the words. Remember, you know, remember a few minutes ago, I, I quoted a verse from Romans chapter 6. It says, the wages of sin is death. And I didn't quote the whole verse. Well, actually, I only quoted half the verse. I only share with you, I only share with you the bad news. The second part of the verse adds the good news. Here's the good news this morning. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, the Apostle Paul, hundreds of years later, he has, he has his own little poetic device going here. He's making a point by comparing and contrasting opposites. He compares wages with gifts, and then he compares sin with God, and then he contrasts death and eternal life. The wages of sin is death, yes, but the gift of God is eternal life, another form of Hebrew poetry. All right, what have we learned so far as we walk through this? So far we have learned that sin is the root cause of all pain and suffering and evil in our world. That's the first thing that we learned. And so far we've learned that God has responded to this reality by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to deal decisively with sin. Those are two things that we learned. He did this by taking the consequences of sin upon himself. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his stripes. Watch this. We are healed. We are healed. And there it is. There's that word healed. The Bible says that the work of Jesus on our behalf actually brings healing, can bring healing into our lives. The Bible says that the consequences of sin, pain, death, and suffering, and sorrow are healed by the work of Jesus on the cross. Now, the word healed in the original Hebrew means to become fresh, to mend, to repair. So get this, folks. This is crucial. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to follow me with this. It's really important this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, watch this. God guarantees that every aspect of your life, body, soul, mind, and spirit, will be mended, repaired, will be made like new. By his wounds, we are healed. How many can say amen to that? Okay, good. How many have some questions, though? You have some questions? Have I raised some questions? Good. I'm glad. I'm glad, I'm glad you're asking these questions because I'll see if I can identify and read your mind this morning. I mean, you know, you say, yes, yes, pastor, I hear you, but, but I, I got a lot of questions, like, like questions like, okay, pastor, if that is true, then why do followers of Jesus still get sick? Why do followers of Christ still die? Why is that the case? Think of it this way. Here's the best way that I can explain this to you as I've thought about it in search of scriptures. Think about it this way. We live in a unique time of, of overlap. An overlap, there's an overlap right now of two kingdoms. Let me talk about those two kingdoms. Two kingdoms that are existing simultaneously. They are opposite kingdoms, but they're existing at the very same time. You read your Bible, you see these two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of darkness, when did this kingdom begin? This started when sin entered the world. When Adam sinned, the kingdom of darkness was unleashed in the world, as we talked about. Now, Jesus brought in the other kingdom. He brought in the kingdom of God. When he came to earth, he suffered and he died and he rose again. Jesus brought in the kingdom, but, but I want you to know something about Jesus' kingdom. And as you re read through the scriptures, you'll begin to understand there, here, um, it's, it's, it's not fully here yet. It's not fully here yet. He brought in a kingdom, but it's not fully here yet. Okay? Listen to what Jesus I don't, says. It's, this is not on PowerPoint, but listen to what it says. He says, it's actually in the Lord's Prayer. Listen to what he says. He says, Our Father, who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Watch this. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 
It's coming, but it's not fully here yet. So we have these two kingdoms existing simultaneously at the same time, and it seems like we've got a foot in each kingdom living on this earth. We've got a foot in each kingdom. We've got the kingdom of darkness where sin reigns. Sin reigns in this kingdom of darkness. In other words, we experience sin. But in the kingdom of God, when it fully comes, sin is completely obliterated. There is no sin in the kingdom of God when it's established fully. In the kingdom of darkness, we are completely cut off from the presence of God. Sin has cut us off and prevented us from being in the presence of God. But in the kingdom of God, we have complete and full access to the presence of God. In the kingdom of darkness, death reigns. Death rules, death haunts and taunts us. In the kingdom of God, death is completely obliterated. There is no death in the kingdom of God. But here's the thing. You and I live in a time of overlap. We live where these two kingdoms overlap, where they both exist at the same time. And watch how this is. We live where sin has been defeated, yes, but it's not yet terminated entirely. We live where we have direct access to God, yes, but it's through the veil of sin, weakened bodies. Things are not perfect yet. We live where death has been defeated, yes, but has not been completely eradicated. This is, that is what it is like to live in the time of overlap. Your complete healing is coming, it's guaranteed by God because it was purchased by Jesus when he was wounded for our transgressions, when he was bruised for our iniquities, when the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we were healed. But we haven't got that complete healing yet. Which is why Paul said in Ephesians that God has given us his Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteed actually what, guaranteeing what will actually come. So he says these words, and I didn't give them to you, they're not on PowerPoint. He says, listen, I want you to know, you're not going to experience my kingdom fully yet, but I'm good for it. And to prove to you that I'm good for you, I'm going to give you a down payment. I'm going to allow my Holy Spirit to live within you, guaranteeing that I am, I'm good for the rest. So he gives us our Holy Spirit. So when, we, when will we be able to cash in on this guaranteed complete healing that Jesus has purchased for us. I would say to you today, when God's kingdom fully comes, when God's kingdom fully comes, all suffering will be obliterated. That means eliminated, will be gone and finished forever. And so the Bible talks about that, for, that future kingdom that will come when it fully comes. Listen to what the Bible says. Looking into the future, the apostle John was given a vision of the future, and he wrote these words in in Revelation chapter 21, he says, watch this. This is when God's kingdom comes in fullness. He said he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There is no more mourning, no more crying. There'll be no more pain. That's when God's kingdom is fully established. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, he said, listen, describing that moment, he said this, the perishable, meaning that which can die. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, that which cannot die, and the mortal with immortality. And when this happens in the future, when the saying that is written will come true, then we can say death has finally, you know, been swallowed up in victory. And Paul's talking about a future tense, a kingdom when God has established his kingdom, where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, and we will be with him in eternal forever. So let me review a little bit that I've said, because I've shared a few things with you this morning. So when it comes to experiencing healing, what the Bible teaches is this. We have learned that sickness and death are rooted in the reality of sin. We've learned that Jesus dealt decisively with sin when he died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. We've learned as followers of Christ, we live in the present experience of two worlds, two kingdoms, two realities overlapping, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. We've learned whatever I'm going through today, I have God's guarantee that healing is in my 
future. It's guaranteed in Jesus Christ. I have God's guarantee that this perishable must put on imperishable. I have God's guarantee that this mortal must put on immortality. I have God's guarantee that death will one day entirely be swallowed up in victory. Are you still with me? Still with me? Yes, but, but pastor. <laughs> but pastor. What about miraculous healings now? Let's not talk about the future, Pastor. Well, I did. There's a foundation, scriptural understanding. But what about miraculous healings today, Pastor? What about now? Isn't healing, shouldn't it be an option for today? I know one day I'll be with Jesus and I'll be whole. But what about today? Do we have to wait for God's kingdom totally to come in the future? Can we experience uh, healing in some supernatural way today? And I would say yes, absolutely, absolutely. Miraculous healings are, uh, are, are an option. In fact, we are encouraged by God to ask him for the miraculous. We are encouraged to pray and to intercede and to ask God to heal, to lay hands on people and anoint them with oil. Yes, we are told to pray for the miraculous and expect the miraculous to happen today. So what is the miraculous? Let's just think about that for a minute before we go any further. What is, what is a miracle? A miracle is God, here it is, is God intervening in the natural course of events. It's God interrupting the natural course of events. It's not God breaking laws. It's him intervening in the natural uh, course of events. Like if, if you drop an apple, you know, I, I put my hand out, you drop an apple, I'm intervening in the natural course of events. The apple will normally fall to the ground, but I catch it and I stop it from, from touching the ground. That's a miracle. God is intervening to the point where if God did not intervene, the natural outcome would have been completely different for that. A miracle is the bypassing of the natural order of things. A body that was on the natural path of steady decay suddenly for no natural reason experiences a miraculous regeneration, healing. A body that was incapable of functioning suddenly for no, no natural reason has the capability to function. A miracle is, is a bypassing of the natural order of things. When, when Jesus walked on the earth, he often used miracles, and he used them, if you follow along and you read about the miracles in the Bible, he used them for a specific purpose, if you kind of analyze each text. What's the purpose? His, his purpose was always to help people understand who he was. He wanted them to know that he was God, and he used miracles at times to show them. Let me give you some scriptures to prove that for you. For example, well, in, well into his ministry, when Jesus was visiting the temple in Jerusalem, and, uh, and, and his critics were circling, circling him like wolves, how long... You know, they're saying things like, how long will you keep us in suspense? They say, if you're the Messiah, come right out and tell us. And so Jesus answered, in John chapter 10, he said, I did tell you, but you didn't listen. The miracles or the works, different translations, I do in my Father's name, they speak of me. They speak of me. He also said, he also said, don't believe me unless I do what my Father does but if I do it, even if you don't believe me, believe the works or the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. That's the second scripture. Here's another one. Listen. He revisited that in John 14. Listen to what he says. He said, believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or if you don't believe my words, at least believe on the evidence of the works or the miracles themselves. One evening, a man named Nicodemus, he was a, a, one of uh, Jesus' critics standing in the crowd. And he came to Jesus secretly, and he said, Rabbi, which means teacher, he said these words, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God, for, for no one could perform the miraculous, the, the signs 
that you were doing if God was not with him? And see, the word that Nicodemus used to describe miracles, he called them signs. And that's key. He called them signs. Signs, let's think about signs. Signs, that is the perfect word to describe the function of healings and miracles. They are signs. We live in a city that is covered with signs. What's the purpose of a sign? A sign is never there for its own sake. I never read a sign that read, I never read a sign that says, this is a sign, look at the sign, right? It's always pointing to something else. What's the point? This is a sign. That's mindless. Signs don't point, don't exist for themselves. They don't point to themselves. Signs exist for something outside of themselves. They point towards something. You see a McDonald's sign or whatever. You see a sign. You see a KFC sign. You're not just looking at the sign, you're thinking of the chicken and so on. We won't talk about that anymore. So signs exist for something outside of themselves. A sign is there to direct our attention somewhere else. A sign is there to instruct us, direct us, to inform us about someone or something else. And that's how Jesus used healings through the New Testament. And he still uses healings and miracles when he walked on the earth. They were signs instructing and informing and pointing people to the truth of who he was. And the truth is that God still does that. He still uses miracles as signs. Somebody experiences a miracle, it should always point to Jesus. Wow, Jesus is alive. Jesus is God. That's why he uses, that's why, he, that's what, that's why we call him signs. And so, he still uses miracles of signs. Yes, as we've learned already today, we still experience sickness and pain. And yes, there is coming a day when all suffering and sickness and pain is guaranteed for those that are followers of Jesus Christ to be obliterated. But in the meantime, in this overlap that we live of two kingdoms, God sovereignly heals as a sign pointing to his presence. In the meantime, during this overlap, God sovereignly heals as a sign pointing to himself so we can get to know him. You see, the truth is that God still uses healings. He still uses miracles as a way of directing our attention heavenward. He wants to get us, our eyes off of ourselves and off of our circumstances. He wants people to get their eyes on Jesus. In fact, God promised us that as followers of Jesus that we could expect to see a few signs in our lifetime. The last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven, and I'm quoting from Matthew chapter 16, he says these words, go into all the world and preach the good news of, to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. Watch this, there it is, watch it. And these signs shall accompany those who believe. And watch, what signs? Here they are. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. Wow. And, they, and, they, and they, when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat sitting at the right hand of God. And then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them in confirming his word by signs that accompanied it. Now, okay, pastors, you think about that verse this morning. You say, does this mean that every time I see something deadly, I can chug it? Well, uh, it's kind of like a sign from God for me. Some people have does, you know, maybe taken that maybe too literally. Does that mean when I see deadly snakes, I just pick them up and handle them as proof that God is with me? Um, well, no. Okay, how about no? How about not go down that road? Sometimes we need to kind of understand. We, some people do this misunderstanding this, these passages to their own detriment. What does this all mean? We need to remember, always remember when it, when it comes to God working and God working supernaturally, we need to remember God sovereignly chooses. God chooses. We use the word sovereignty when we discuss God's use God's use of healing today, sovereignty means as God chooses. Sovereignly means as God deems best in a situation, God will respond. Listen, God says there is healing coming in your life. I guarantee it. 
In the meantime, I'm going to sovereignly, as I deem best, as I choose, I'm going to sprinkle miracles on people's lives. I know all things, God says. And I'm going to choose when to have a sign here and when to have a sign there. I encourage you to ask me. God says, ask me. Ask and pray and intercede and trust me with when to, when to say yes and when to say wait and when to say I'm sorry, no. God says, I love you. I have a purpose and a plan. Trust me to know when to do the right thing. You ask. Our role, folks, is to ask. You ask and God says, you trust me with the answer and I will sovereignly, I will decide how I'll respond to you based on what is best for you. As a follower of Jesus Christ, God's healing in your life is guaranteed. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Is it going to be a time when the kingdom fully comes? Or am I going to experience it now in some area of my life and get a fresh healing? That's the thought. Now, as we begin, we begin to land this message, I'm sure some of you are thinking, and I try to get back into your minds and think, what are you thinking now as I share that truth with you? What are you thinking? I'm sure some of you are thinking, all right, Pastor, you got a little wiggle room here, and I don't like the wiggle room you got with this. What's with this sovereignty stuff? What's with this God's sovereignty stuff? What's with this as God deems best stuff? Why would God pick and choose? Oof. Good question. Why wouldn't God just heal everybody who asks? Why not? Good question. If God really wants people to believe in him, why wouldn't he heal every single person who asks to be healed? Why not? I mean, obviously, you could not ignore that sign. I mean, obviously, obviously, if God did a miracle, obviously, every time, everybody would believe, right? Right? How many people think that? Really? Read your Bibles. Well, the answer to that question brings us back full circle, all the way back to the beginning of the root of sin. And sin is twisting, it's blinding, it has blinding effects, really. Here's the truth of the matter. Signs don't always work, folks. They don't always work. Sin can be that blinding that people still don't see Jesus. The truth of the matter is people can see a sign, people can fully recognize a sign, people can f completely understand what a sign is saying, and people can still ignore the sign. Drivers do that. Have you noticed? <laughs> we ignore the signs. <laughs> Not you, of course. Not all. Signs can be ignored. Jesus' critics had been given three years of miraculous signs when Jesus walked the earth. Yet they still circled him with stones in their hands in their, in their attempt to kill him. And Jesus looked at him and he said in John 10, he said, I have showed you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Hello. <laughs> in Luke chapter 16, this is a classic one for you. Jesus told the story of two men who died. And they had two different experiences with death. One man went to a place of comfort. Another man went to a place of torment, if you remember that story. And the man in the, in the place of torment cried out to Father Abraham, Father, the father of the Jewish nation, he said these words. He said, Father Abraham, please release me. And Abraham said, no, you've got your choices. You've got to live with your choices. Will at least this other man, Lazarus, who died, at least send him from the dead to warn my brothers who are still alive on earth. Send them on to warn my family. And Father Abraham says this, watch this. He says, no, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. What's he saying? He's literally saying they've got scriptures. They have enough evidence in the scriptures. The issue isn't people don't know God exists. God says that's not the issue. God says, I've given them more than enough through creation and scripture. Oh, but Father Abraham, if someone was to rise from the dead, then they would really believe. And listen to what Jesus says. He says, if you, don't, if, you, if, you, if you don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they'll not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Even a sign like that won't convince them. 
And a matter of months later, watch this, a matter of months later, Jesus proved it. He rose from the dead, right? And the guards who were at the tomb, you think about that account, they saw it, they saw the stone rolled away, they saw the, resur- they, they saw the resurrected Christ, and they ran to tell people who had hired them to guard the tomb. It says in Matthew chapter 28, it says, while the women were on their way, the women saw it. They are off telling the disciples. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and said, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away, stole him away while we were sleeping. And so the soldiers take the money and, and they say, deal, done. And that's a story that spread to the community. They saw Jesus the evidence of Jesus that he had risen from the dead, and they still refuse to believe. And so, folks, I would say to this morning, signs are not a guarantee that people will always believe. So how do we wrap up this message this morning? Well, what should we do? What should we do as followers of Jesus Christ that believe in the Bible, believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and God is still a healing God. Even though we don't understand all the issues around healing, what should we do? We should pray. That's what the Bible says. And we say, God, God, move in your mighty power. God, you are able to do the impossible, and I'm just working on the authority of your word. You told us to pray and believe, and that, God, you will respond sovereignly to situations I know you've guaranteed me healing in the future, but you're able to do it now, and I invite you, and I ask you to heal me now. But I trust you, Lord, and I trust you because you know all things, and you do all things well, and so I trust you with the results, Lord. That's faith. That's faith, folks. And so in a few minutes, we're going to open the altars, and and I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite Pastor Marilyn and Pastor Ed and the board to come. They're going to come first. I'm going to get you to stand across the front, and we're going to invite you to come, folks. You have a need. You have um, a family need. You have you know, health issues. Um, you're praying for someone. You're standing in proxy for somebody. I invite you to come. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to do exactly what the Bible says. Amen? And we're just going to believe God. You know, again, folks, you know what? We're not going to understand all of healing. I don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers, but the fact is we go on the authority of God's word and we pray in Jesus' name and we believe God for great things. Amen? Amen. We'll believe that God will touch you and heal you in Jesus' name. Let me say this before we close this morning. You know, the most radical healing you can experience right now is actually in your own heart. Did you know that? That's That's the greatest healing. It's in your relationship with God. When, when a person, um, that person is, is not a follower of Christ, has never invited Christ to come into their life, they're, they're, they're well, we're all sinners, but they're, they're sinners. They're sinners. They're, if they die in that state, if you, if you are a sinner today and you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, you would die in that state, you're lost. There's no hope, no hope at all. But what happens when I invite Jesus, say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, come into my life, cleanse me from my sin, he comes in and he transforms your heart, which is the greatest miracle of all. It's an eternal miracle. It's going to, I mean, your body is going to eventually die. Even if you get healed, you're going to die. But one day when you die, if you have Jesus in your life, you will enjoy that full kingdom. Amen? Amen. And so if you've never made that decision today, that's the greatest miracle, folks. Many times when Jesus talked to people, many, he would talk to them about healing, but he'd also talk about their soul. <laughs> Do something about your soul. That was important. So before we open the altars, bow your heads with me and close your eyes when no one's looking around. Just, wanna, just want to talk to you just for a minute about the condition of your soul. If you are here this morning, and if you've invited Christ to come into your life, and he lives in there, he's come to cleanse you from your sin. And so you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ, and Jesus has transformed you. But if you're here this morning and you've never made that decision to invite Jesus in your heart, never invited, you may be religious, you go to church, religious motions and so on, but if you don't have Jesus, you'd like to do that today, 
while your eyes are closed and no one's looking around, if you want to make that decision today between you and God, I'd like you to raise your hand. Anybody? That may be scary. Yes, I see those two hands there. Yes. Yes, I saw those two hands. Great. You've never made that decision before, and you'd like to invite Jesus to come into your life to transform you, your inward being. Two people have responded. Anyone else this morning? Well, we give you a chance to respond. I would pray that every person in this room has made that decision for Christ. But, I, but if there's one here that I don't know what would keep you from making the decision, I pray that God would just woo you into his presence. You respond to him. Anyone at all? Okay, what I'd like to do this morning, while your head's about and your eyes are closed, I'm going to say a general prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. And I want everyone in this place to repeat that prayer after me. And those, there's two people that raised their hands for the very first time. I want you to say this prayer with me, and you say it from your heart, and Jesus will come into your life and cleanse you from your sin. And so we're going to pray, and you can repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I understand that you came to die for my sin. Jesus, come into my life, cleanse my heart, and make it pure and make it whole. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus, I, I believe with all my heart, there's two people here that, um, based on their response, this is the first time they have invited you to come into their heart. And they, as the Bible says, have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You've changed them. You've come to live in their lives. And they begin a new relationship with you, Lord. That's how easy it is. You didn't make it hard for us to get saved because you wanted us to get saved. You wanted us to have a relationship with you. And so I pray for those two, Lord, you just confirm it to their hearts, in their hearts. And Lord, I, I just obviously want to meet with them before they go and talk with them, explain things through with them. But I pray that you would make yourself real to them right now. We pray in Jesus' precious name. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for each person that's here. Thank you for your presence that was with us, Jesus. God, in the next few minutes, in the next while, we, as we move into an altar time, God, I pray you would come in power, that you would come in strength, Lord, that, Lord, the virtue, the virtue that flowed from your side, Lord, as that woman who pressed the crowd in the Bible says, to touch the hem of your garment, the Bible says that virtue began to flow, and that was the power of God that began to flow, and she was instantly made whole. I pray that would happen in this place this morning. On the authority of your word, we pray. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me this morning. As we begin to sing that great song, He Touched Me, I'm going to invite, first of all, Pastor Ed and Pastor Marilyn, our board members, to come stand facing you. You can come right now. And if you would like prayer this morning, come. Let's just turn this place into an altar service. Let's turn this whole room. If you don't come, just spend some time praying for those that would come. And let's believe for miracles this morning. Amen? Amen.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't it good just to stand in God's presence? Amen. Isn't it good just to enjoy His presence? Sometimes we rush in, rush out. Oh, God is here by His Spirit. Just to soak in of His presence. Hallelujah. So I'm listening to those songs. I shout my eyes and I think back. You know, I, is that a sign I'm getting older? I think back. As a young child standing around the altar and worshiping the Lord as, as a younger teenager. Just brings back a lot of memories, those songs. Wow. Wow. They're good. Thank you, Lord, for your presence uh, here today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. We believe you're in control, God. We believe that we just follow your word, and you do. You work sovereignly as you choose to work. And God, I just believe, God, you've done some good things around the altar. And we'll just wait to hear what you've done this morning. Because you're the one that does it. Nobody does it. It's you. You work supernaturally, and we trust you. And even those that are maybe online this morning, Lord, that are reaching out to you, maybe you touch them, Lord, in a special way. I, I, it'd be good to hear from those people, too. Oh, God, thank you for your presence. God, continue to be with us and lead us and direct us into our future. Even as we gather tonight for a prayer meeting, Lord, oh, God, we're going to call on your name. We believe that, God, you're going to do amazing things in our churches and in our community to build your kingdom, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for this time today. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a great day. God bless. Praise you, Jesus.